security studies. I uh, am very pleased to welcome you here to the presentation of the Edgar S. Furness Junior Book Award, which is one of the Mershon Center's longest established rituals. And like all rituals, it was interrupted by the pandemic. And we are now happy to be catching up with it after this hiatus. So this fall, we are conferring the award for 2020. And in the spring, uh, we will confer the award for 2021, which we will be announcing shortly. This award commemorates the founding director of the Mershon Center, and it's given annually to an author whose first book is judged to make an exceptional contribution to the study of national and international security. So the Committee for 2020 found such an exceptional contribution in <laughs> uh, Jason Lyle's book, Divided Armies, Inequality and Battlefield Performance in Modern War, published in 2020 by Princeton University Press in the series, Princeton Studies in International History and Politics. Um, committee members did indeed uh, find it an exceptional contribution. Our committee chair and eminent military historian, Jeffrey Parker, described it as the most amazing book I've read for a very long time, if ever. Jeffrey went on to say, this reflects the time and thought Lyle has devoted to the subject. He got his PhD in 2005, and since then he's done extensive field work. I checked his CV, so this is what Jeffrey does, on his fieldwork in Afghanistan, he wrote no longer updating during due to security risk, created his own database, Project Mars, and read widely in several languages, notably Russian as well as English. He's also spent, I'm still quoting Jeffrey Parker, he's also spent a lot of time working on his prose because his book reads very well indeed, which again is a meaningful compliment from that source. Finally, his book puts forward a bold and plausible theory, the concept of military inequality. I suspect his theory explains the collapse of the Afghan army the year after he published. And today, obviously, we might add some reflections on the battlefield performance of the Russian army. Sociologist and Ralph Marchand Professor of Human Security, Laura Jugan, and special appreciation for the creation of the Project Mars data set, which as of yesterday has been downloaded 2,812 times. Laura highlights the payoff of mixed methods subsumed under a rigorous research design. Amy Schumann, the ethnographer of the committee who studies conflict and face-to-face -face interaction herself, was impressed by Lyle's accounts of dynamics within military units and his ingenious parsing of ever new dimensions in event data. And as an English professor, she likewise highlighted the elegance of the writing. And as another folklorist who wasn't on the committee, I'll just add that I liked the theorization of battlefield performance uh, based in socialization. So we all have particular um, fondnesses. So with that, we are delighted to add Jay Lyle to a list of Furness Award winners that includes such elders as John Gearsheimer and Stephen Waltz, and younger scholars like Jesse Driscoll, Karen Yarra Milo, and Aisha Ahmad. We hereby project, present him with this handsome objectification of the award, which he is going to I don't want to drop it or have it I didn't want to be a good skill testing component to the uh, spot at the top. Yes, of course. Oh, that's fantastic. And if you would now hold it up, I would like to hold one. You have to move on. Oh, yes. All right. Three, two, three. And one more. Three, two. And one more. Uh, and with that, yes, we will be pleased to hear from him more both about this uh, book and about his current projects. Now, to introduce him more fully, we are turning to Professor Chris Jelby, who is our Marshall Chair of Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution. And I will now. I will surrender. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Well, it is great to be here. Uh, you have
to introduce uh, Jason Lyle. Uh, I have followed your work through your career uh, from afar, as you've written probably more articles where I read it afterwards and said, shoot, I wish I'd done that uh, than, than just about anybody else in the field. So to me, that's, you know, that's, that's the, the best uh, I, I can hope for out of an article. So um, really fascinating work. Um, Professor Lyle is currently the, the James, Wright Direct, uh, James Wright Chair in Transnational Studies and Associate Professor in the Government Department at Durham. He is the Director of the Political Violence Field Lab um, at the Sloan Hickey Center for, Interna um, for International Understanding at Dartmouth, and he is a member of the 2020 class of Andrew Carnegie Fellows. Um, it, although he will be talking to us about his uh, first work, yeah. um, while, while he'll be talking to us about his first work, he has a number of uh, interesting current projects he's also working on, um, including um, the, the focus on the effectiveness of political violence in civil and conventional wars. He's writing a book on lessons learned from the American war in Afghanistan. He's uh, working on a book about how to improve humanitarian assistance uh, in fragile conflict settings. And uh, he's working on a project on uh, inequality and intergroup relations in uh, army and uh, police effectiveness. Uh, so with that, I introduce you to uh, Professor Jason Lyle, and we look forward to uh, hearing about your work. Thank you. Um, I feel like you should stop the talk now because it means such wonderful words. I mean, all I'm going to do is puncture the illusion, I think. Um, uh, but thank you very much for, for having me here. Thank you very much for this honor. Um, I have to say this is my first talk uh, in, since 2020 in person. Yeah. Uh, and I've been told I'm going to try and speak for 35 minutes and probably even going to overshoot it. So please just tell me if I'm babbling or anything like that. Uh, but this means a, a lot to me in part because I did work on the book for a very long time. Uh, I, you know, I, I tell a story of, uh, of when I had the idea initially up in Afghanistan, I had the idea and I, I thought, well, one year to sit and write, one year to collect data, and then one year for to publish, and then it's like start up and done. So three years from, from the time I'm in this, this, conch, or this um, shack in, in Afghanistan to, to academic glory, uh, it took about 10 years. Um, so I, I completely overshoot by a factor of three. Uh, and, um, and so, and I managed to finish it just in time for the pandemic. Uh, and so I actually have never seen it in real life uh, and uh, actually didn't know if anyone was reading it. So the fact that such an interdisciplinary group of people, uh, so many walks uh, uh, of the academic spectrum, liked it and actually read it, it means more to me than I can actually say because uh, the pandemic I know was rough for everybody. And the fact that some of you read it, four people read it, yeah. amazing, amazing. I mean, maybe more than four, maybe a dozen. Um, but, um, but, but thank you very much for this honor. So, um, what I wanted to do is just give you a gist of the book. Uh, it is a, as you phrase, it's a, a little bit of a long book. Um, and so I'm not going to do all of it. I'm going to do kind of like those are the greatest hits. And then maybe, like Chris was saying, sort of pull back at the end and sort of say maybe where we're going to go and sort of things that are ongoing um, now or already sort of in, in the process. Particularly since I haven't been able to do field work since COVID. I've been kind of working a little bit with the US Army on inclusion and diversity. And it might be interesting that we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, but what I wanted to do is, is actually start in, uh, is, that, is, that okay? is it a little weak? No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I just actually wanted to start with the war in Ukraine, which seems to be sort of an obvious place to begin. Um, we're actually in some ways seeing both the theme of the book and the argument of the book in real time. Uh, if you cast your mind back to February, um, this was sort of the, the Consensus view. Like he couldn't hold for more than three days. Or General Milley actually said 72 hours and he will fall. Uh, that's Ian Bremmer there. He's saying he's the skeptic. He's saying maybe Ukraine can come over for a couple of weeks. Um, and this was really our Western allies thought this. The well, Pentagon did, the intelligence analysts did, the public side of it. A lot of scholars felt the same way uh, that he could hold maybe at the most for a week. Um, this is a screenshot from two days ago from uh, Ukrainian social media. These are helmets and body armor that have been abandoned by Russian forces as they're fleeing from uh, outside of Kyushan, trying to get a, across a river in sort of mass disorder. Uh, and basically from February until now, we see with the second strongest army in Europe uh, go from being this absolute juggernaut to almost completely falling apart. 
Uh, and in fact, today, and now we're seeing credible reports, and this is something I'll, I'll chat a little bit about it as we go through the data, that the Russians are holding some of their forces together through violence, because they're actually threatening or in some cases shooting their own soldiers to hold them in ranks. So we've gone from, from this to this in the span of about eight months, and, and the trick is why? Right? And what does the war in Ukraine raise about questions about military power, how countries generate it, how they don't generate it, like much above their weight in the case of Ukraine, and then take the brush upon below their weight. And that's really what the, the point of the book is. So this is my entire 400 page book in a slide. Um, so really the question is what explains battlefield performance in modern war? Modern war here really means uh, conventional war between organized armies that inflict about 500 fatalities on, on either side, about uh, the total of like 500 fatalities. Uh, the answer, and there's lots of answers, this is an old question, right? This is sort of a classic political science question. Uh, some would say it's the size of the army, some would say it's the technology, some would say it's the political regime, or the democratic, or the autocratic. Uh, so why do we need another theory and another 400 page book on this question? Well, I think we're missing something. Uh, and that is sort of the human capital of the army. Uh, and in particular, that's the inequality among the ethnic groups that make up those armies. And the key here is that it's embedded pre-war in the relations between these ethnic groups and the state. And how do you build your army? And how do you include these ethnic and racial groups inside your army? Before the war, will dictate how it fights once the war ends. And the sort of bumper sticker version of the argument is uh, the higher the inequality in the ranks, the worse it's going to be. And you might say, well, why anchor into ethnic groups? Uh, what is it about ethnicity that matters so much? And, and part of it is because it's a sticky identity, right? That people can see it, the state operates, says, I see ethnic groups in my population, it's going to treat them differently. Um, but one of the other reasons is most of our theories just assume that soldiers are universal, they're homogenous. They are just soldiers and they follow orders. That's what they do. They go to boot camp, they get indoctrinated, then off they go. So most of our theories of war in political science, particularly in national relations, just abstract away from the people in the army. But through some of the new data we collect through Project Mars, we sort of lift the lid and look inside the armies and see that they're incredibly diverse ethnically. So the average army. That has fought since 1800, and that's really the time scale. The data goes from 1800 to 2011, uh, has had five ethnic groups inside of it. There's almost no example since 1800 of a mono ethnic army. So, this is kind of where we're going to go and sort of begin theorizing from these potential divisions within these armies. So, that, that's part of why I think we're missing that side of the, the human capital story of our armies. So again, the book is long. It has this nested research design, which I am absolutely not going to go through all of them, but they designed to sort of fit piece, piece by piece. So there's a natural experiment where we see the rise of a very inclusive army and a, a very inclusive leader in the Mahdiya and with the contemporary Sudan. Um, he builds his army through uh, the tribal connections, ethnic connections, religious connections, very, very sort of inclusive, managed to push out the Egyptians, managed to push out the British, and then we the leader uh, dies and is replaced by a new effort of little scuffling. A new leader comes into power. He comes in with an incredibly extreme exclusionary vision of the state. He begins genocide against certain populations, even as he's drafting them into the army. And his army will fall apart and suffer the worst, one of the worst um, military defeats in Africa that we've seen in military history. So it's like this focal point where you have a very inclusive regime doing well. Snap turns on his book of history. The new leader comes in, very exclusionary, very unequal army, and his regime is destroyed and his uh, built. Um, um, I will have a little bit about that if you're interested. I got all the cool slides and stuff like that, but I just, just that's just designed to be theory building. The heart of the book is really Project Mars. And this is where I have to stop and to say thank you uh, to all of the undergrad and graduate students who work on this project. So this would not have been possible at all without my students. Uh, we coded for over seven years to get this data set right. There were 134 uh, students. If you actually look at the acknowledgments, you count them, there's 133. We left 134 in there because uh, of the ones we, some who were like, we didn't stay very long. We wanted to acknowledge them, but so, so there's at least 134 people uh, who worked on it. We worked in 20 different languages, and we began to try and collect new kinds of data. Things like uh, how many soldiers were deserted, 
How many soldiers were fleeing from your army and fighting men against you? Right. How many times were the army using violence against foreign soldiers? So things that we'd seen in the history um, of these wars, but no one had gone back and systematically covered them. And then the amazing thing is that we can work because the undergraduates are, and graduates are, are so amazing. They have language skills. We were working in 20 different languages. So most of the data we typically use that correlates with war in particular, which is the main study of the data set in a, uh, of conflict studies, is all almost English language focus. What we could do then is go back and use these multiple languages to bring new histories in and new belligerents who have been excluded for one reason or another from the correlates of war in your state war data set. So what we're looking at here is a brand new data set that goes from 1800 that brings in all kinds of new belligerents that we haven't seen, new behaviors that we haven't seen on the battlefield, and also new measures for um, in, uh, inequality. That we have in so it took a really long time, uh, and I'm glad that it's been down with many times I didn't know that actually, but uh, but that's really the heart of it. In that, there's three historical comparisons spanning 150 years, uh, and then two paired comparisons from archival work with soldier records on the Battle of Moscow in 1945. I'm going to concentrate on Project Mars and on the um, Soviet rifle division. So we can kind of see what it looks like from a very, very fine grain, and then looking at the sweeping 200 years of history um, together. So you may be wondering. Theoretically, why inequality? What's the problem with inequality, right? Aren't they just soldiers running around just to follow the order, right? So inequality has four kind of corrosive effects inside your military. One is it throws away your diversity bonus. So the more kind of perspectives you have, the better you are a problem solver. If you don't empower the diversity in your army, or right, if you suppress certain groups, you get tunnel vision or you become more rigid in your thinking, less adaptable about the surprise, and you can make yourself more vulnerable. Second, you will lower the morale from them. Obviously, uh, among those discriminated groups, they don't want to fight on behalf of the regime that is progressive. Uh, you're seeing this in Russia today, I argue that, and this is what I'm come back to. Uh, they, these countries will still bring them inside the military, but they don't want to be there. It's not their war. You see that kind of language across all the cases. It's not our war. Uh, they're, not, they're not believing in the state because they're treated as second class in this new wars. Third, it will lower the trust between the ethnic groups. Right? So if you have a privileged ethnic group and maybe they're the officers and you have a discriminated groups or repressed groups, there's no trust within them. Right? If you don't have trust within your military units, they fall apart. Right? They seem to desert, they can't engage in complex operations. So the trust begins to erode once you have discrimination and, and repression. And then finally, as the state is heading in its hand towards certain ethnic groups, you help reinforce those group identities. Those group identities are not pro-state, they're anti-state. So what do they do with their group identities? They, they use them to organize collective action to escape. So you strengthen the ability of them to, to flee or to subvert the military authorities. Okay, so inequality has these four kind of corrosive effects. If you think of it as like a poison inside your military. And the more inequality you've got, the worse it's going to be. In particular, because it's not like the commanders are surprised. You say, oh, we have discriminated groups in our midst. How did this happen? Right? They know that and they're acting on it. So what they do is they often adopt policies designed to hold these soldiers in place. They'll become more uh, rigid in their tactics. They won't let the soldiers be decentralized or because they're going to escape. So you got to close them all. You got to surveil them more. You got to monitor them more. You can't let them have initiative. You can't let them be decentralized. But all those things get you killed on the battlefield because the modern battlefield needs you to be decentralized. It needs independent thinking. It needs to be creative and fast. These commanders know that there's this problem inside, so they become rigid and inflexible, and they clamp down harder on their soldiers. So on the one hand, the soldiers don't want to be there. The commanders know that, and so they're implementing measures. So by the time these divided armies get into the battlefield, they're all kind of tortured up inside. They're not the military efficient machines that we read about in the theories. They're not optimizing or maximizing for combat power. They're trying to hold themselves together according to a political logic, not necessarily a military logic. The danger is when they get on the battlefield and they fight somebody that's not built like this, they're going to be in trouble. So this is what's sowing the seeds for trouble. This is the only slide that has a little bit of math. I mean, it has to be short. You may think, okay, how are you, are you, how do you measure the quality? So um, if there's any economists here, this will look like a Gini coefficient and how we measure income inequality. Except imagine doing a Gini coefficient, but for a military. So all we need to know for measuring inequality is two pieces of information. 
We need to know the army's demographics on the eve of battle. So we have one group is 25%, group B is 50%, group C is 25%. And then we need to know how the state is treating each of those ethnic groups. If the ethnic groups are seen as full citizens of the state, there's no discrimination, there's no repression, you just get assigned to zero. If there's discrimination, say economic or political discrimination, we assign a 0.5 value. And if the state is actively repressing those groups, they get a point. So there's, there's maybe a genocide going on, or forced displacement, or, or um, we often see often collective starvation as a tool against certain groups. Um, you will get a one. All you do then is sum the totals of each ethnic group by the way in which they're treated by the state. That generates a value between zero and one. That's it. As you move towards the one, you're getting much more unequal, much more divided. You do not want to be near the one. A zero would be a perfect equality army. Every ethnic group in it is treated equally by the state and are all seen as full citizens. A one, which never actually happens um, in the historical record, would be every single person in that army is drawn from an ethnic group that is being repressed by the state. You can't actually get to that. There's a ceiling effect because you can't actually have an army like that. You need some people to trust. So uh, empirically, the, the highest we see is around 0.75. 8, which is interestingly enough exactly where G income uh, coefficient pops out as well. So you can never have a society where like one person owns everything, although we're trying that maybe now in the United States, but uh, you also can't have an army where everybody's solely from excluded uh, from a repressed ethnic group. That's all the math. So all we have to do is say somewhere between the zero and one, and as you get one, get towards one and get worse. Kim, I can show you some of this in the data. Absolutely. Okay, so. This is the probability that your army is going to experience a high rate of casualties, higher than you're, um, than you're inflicting on their side, so you're suffering casualties. There's mass desertion, so 10% or more of your army goes home. Here's mass defection, 10% or more of your army picks up its arms and fights against you. Uh, and this is the probability of using what we call blocking attachments. Uh, this is a Soviet era practice, but not just a Soviet city. This is a specialized unit that stands behind your soldiers and as they retreat, they should do it. Every one of these dots is an army in the project Mars. And all we're looking for is the patterns. So as you go from zero up to 0.8, you see the probability of experiencing these behaviors all go up. Okay, so in each of these instances, as you move towards the one, bad things are starting to happen to you. Um, if you're interested, the Russian army today is somewhere right around here. It's about 0.25. So it's up on the threshold here. You can start seeing mass desertion, right? You see the odds of experiencing higher casualties and being inflicting. It's all kind of along these curves. So that's 1800 to 2011, all on one slide. You see these S curves, the inequality looks bad. This is exactly the same thing, except historians have rightly noted that the 19th century is not the same as the 20th century in warfare, right? So you want to know, does the argument work in different historical time periods? So this is just exactly what you saw before, just broken up between 1800 and 1917, which 1917 is the cut point because that's when a lot of scholars would say the modern era of war began, so uh, under the end of World War I. Uh, and then from, from 1918 until basically now. In every one of these instances, again, as you turn the dial up on inequality, you get bad things happening to your army. Your higher casualties go up, desertion rates go up, Defection rates go up, the use of blocking detachments goes up, and this is just an index of these four things. Your overall performance goes down. So as you dial up, your performance starts falling away. Now you might be wondering, is this really just about diversity? Right? So you just take a number of groups, you put them together, maybe they don't speak the same language, economists say this is a transaction cost. So maybe it's a story about diversity and not about sort of inequality or things like that. So this is just rerunning it. This is the number of uh, soldiers you have, the number of groups you have in your army. So there's a little effect, but not much. And sometimes it's not statistically significant. So if it's touching zero, it's not statistically significant. So there's a little effect from having more and more groups in your army. But in this case, when we turn the dial up here, this is like going from one ethnic group in your army to about 26, which would be really, really big. And not many had that. So this is going from a very low level to a huge level. It's not doing much. 
So it's not really a story here of diversity in terms of number of ethnic groups creating problems. It's really what's driving this analysis is how the state is treating each of those ethnic groups. It's the level of inclusion, not the number of groups in it. Uh, in the particular item. That, that's the quantitative stuff. So there's the best big picture, right? The, the cases in the book are designed to walk you through some of the armies and see how they're performing. I would love to take you on a trip. The, the, we have everything from the Madia to Kokan, which is my personal favorite, uh, Morocco. We have two empires, Habsburg and the Ottoman empires, comparing them. Um, all I want to do right now is show you this is the, the cases summarized in the table. And again, as you go up on the inequality scale, you see battlefield performance. This is the overall index dropping. So you're seeing exactly the same thing you're seeing in the quantitative regressions as you are in the qualitative cases. We can recover that slope. So each of the cases is trying to show you as a whole that inequality is bad. And if you look at the, just the array of those rock and the, the array of factors, there's tiny states, there's empires, there's modern states, it goes all the way up to, um, to 1998 to 2000, the earliest ones back to 1860. You basically have like 150 years in here, all kinds of regions of the world, uh, and inequality seems to be doing these, these negative effects across all of these cases. The thing I would just flag here is that I never set out to write a book about Morocco and Kokan. Like, what? And the publisher was like, what? Uh, well, why are you doing this? Uh, what I did is I, each of these is in a pair in the book. I chose them um, using an algorithm that would select paired comparisons for me. It would take a high inequality and a low inequality and then find them as similar as they could. And then I would process trace through in, in the different languages um, through the archival materials we could recover. But I wanted to do that because I didn't want to cheat. Like I could pick cases, right, that actually I know fit my argument. But here, I let the software do it for me and tie my hands. If I can give this piece of software to anybody and say, you pull cases for me, and I can show you exactly why I selected them. So I didn't cherry pick. Uh, now, that meant certain problems. So, for example, uh, when we did the uh, Ottoman Empire case, that's uh, that's the war in 1911 in Tripolitania. Um, I, I didn't read Italian when I started the project. Um, I do read Italian now, um, not super well, but it pushed me into cases that I didn't necessarily have a language background for. So I had some, I you know, had Russian and, and Persian I could do, and French I could do, high school, um, uh, and being Canadian. But I didn't have Italian. And I, I didn't have um, German, it was very strong, but it put me into those cases. So this chapter killed me uh, because I'm saying that we're going to be German and Italy, and German and Italian, and, uh, and I, I didn't have those when I started. So it was always good, but um, we also put nine years in the car and see why. Um, let, me, let me take you onto the battlefield in 1941 and walk through some of the argument and just like very, very fine grain level. I want to introduce you to two rifle divisions um, that were uh, fighting in October 1941 on the Soviet side. This is the 38th and the 108th rifle divisions. Okay. So you have the Casper Mines back. This is just on the eve of the German Operation Typhoon. Um, the Red Army is kind of pushed back and now it's holding in these positions. And we have these two rifle divisions sitting side by each in the cold. They're about six kilometers apart from each other. Facing the same German uh, army uh, forces. They're roughly the same size, I think about 10,000 soldiers or so. They're pretty depleted at this point, but about 10,000. Similar complement of men, similar um, you know, weapons. In fact, the 38th had a little, was a little bit stronger than the, than the 108, but, but not by a lot. They're, they're pretty close together. And what we can do um, through declassified division logs, the individual soldier records, um, through narrative histories that the Soviet archives released, we can reconstruct their life histories as divisions and as individuals. And we can trace them through and see what happened. So this is this is the map of their history uh, that we've reconstructed from actually declassified uh, actual Soviet maps. Here is the beginning of the German offensive. There's your 38. There's the 108 on October the 1st. The Germans attack. 30, well, first of all, the headquarters, which is still part of the 16th Army, the headquarter bugs out. It's gone. And it retreats back towards Moscow. So these two units are left with no radio communications to their, to their higher command. So they're on their own. 
which allows us to see like what's going on in these two very similar units, but they don't get any external help. Um, the 38, let's start with the 38. The 38 rolls backward very quickly, uh, loses all contact with his sister units on the other side of it. And, but the reports are coming in that his unit is running away. It's fleeing, it's deserting, um, it's abandoning his positions. The headquarters doesn't get any runners or any, any intelligence from it. They can't find it. They actually send up uh, uh, small spotter planes to try and find the unit. They can't find it. So on the official maps, which I'll show you in a sec, uh, this unit is designated as destroyed on October 7th. That's the last record that you have of it being just wiped out. The 108 here uh, has a very different path. It, for the next two weeks, conducts a rearward fighting retreat, some counteroffensive to push back on the German forces, even as it's losing tons of men. It is getting shredded in this unit, but about 25% of them will make it to a rear staging area. And the Soviets being the Soviets, in about two or three days later, it's reconstituted and put back on the front line. When that's happening, when we get out here October 13th, so we're pushing back towards Moscow, uh, a funny incident happens to the colonel who controlled, uh, was commanding the 38th, appears in the rear area. Uh, what are you doing here, and why is your unit? And he's like, my unit ran. They broke it. And he said, that's not a good enough answer. Right. He said, you should have known that they would have run. You should have taken measures to keep them in place. You shouldn't, have, you, shouldn't, um, you shouldn't be here, essentially. And so they executed it, actually, for failure to maintain discipline among his soldiers and for retreating in this sort of unauthorized way back to the headquarters. Um, so one unit makes it about six days completely shredded, deserts, high casualties. This other unit, the core, makes it out. It does lose a lot of soldiers, but it does maintain that kind of coherent whole. Uh, just to show you really quick, that's a little tough to see. This is the actual declassified map. Mm -hmm. This is the 38th right here. You can see them trying to trace it on the grease pen, mm -hmm. see where it is, marking it out, marking it out. And there's the last known location where you can just see they have, they think that they see it on the 10th, mm -hmm. maybe uh, excuse me, the 11th of October. Maybe they see it, but then you can actually tell it's been scrubbed out. Mm -hmm. That's the final resting place of that division. And then this is the 108th fleeing to the area. So this is the, the official style map. So what's the difference between these two units, right? Oh, sorry, just before you do that. This is the, um, again, a little hard to see, but uh, each row is a soldier. And these are the declassified personnel records that the Russian government has put up, and they made them available on the website. There's 100 million records. We extracted these for these two rifle divisions, and each one is a, is a soldier, sells their birthplace, um, has their name, has their rank, and then what happens to them? Every single soldier on this is from 38. Every single soldier here is um, missing a blood trace. They sort of disappear. That's their official designation in the process. But what's super helpful is the names are in here and the birthplace here. So what we can do is we can reconstruct the ethnic composition of the units, see if they were different, and they were. So everything is very similar here, the size of the space that they're holding, the number of soldiers. The 38, the one that got in, it just disintegrated essentially. 90% staffed by Muslims for the Northern Caucasus. Um, the 10% Russian officer corps hated the Russians. The second the Germans came across the line, they said, This is our chance, we're out of here. One of the interesting things is that we can actually trace the desertion of this. They went in groups, they didn't go in ones and twos. They organized a mass scale desertion 70, 80, 90 soldiers at peace going. Why? Because they could use their linguistic ties. Their, their family ties, you can trace back to their recruiting stations. So many of them are all recruited from the same location in Chechnya, in Pakistan, in Kushetia. You can see they had familial ties coming in, they had the language skills, and the second the unit came, the Germans came across the line, they broke and ran. So 90%, so that military inequality score would be about 0.9 if everyone in there had suffered at the hands of Stalin, whether that be to counterinsurgency in the 1920s, forced population displacement in the 1930s, and in our counterinsurgency campaign in the 1930s, they had experienced direct exposure to the Soviet state. The 108, a little bit of a different unit. So Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Russian. The Russian core is what stayed mostly intact. Many of the Belarusian soldiers, many of the Ukrainian soldiers fled or, or disappeared without a trace. This is often how the Russian uh, hit where the infection uh, the desertion were. The hardcore of Russian mostly remained intact. 
And there, they're more fired by nationalism, right? So they're trying to fight on behalf of the state. The other two groups, much less likely to do so. So that core kind of remained intact. It didn't lose pieces. It didn't fight that well, but it made it in a way that the Northern Caucasus you know. So you may be thinking, okay, so you can explain battlefield performance for the last 200 years. That's okay. But can you do anything else with this frame? So let me just show you a little bit of the new work we're going. Uh, this is actually inspired by Putin. Uh, there's a lot of commentary now on um, whether it'll be a coup against Putin, right? Or whether he's stable in the regime. One of the things we overlook is the nature of the army in which he's using to fight. So is there any connection between the divided nature of your army and the ability of a regime to survive the war? So it turns out, again, going back to this, if you turn the dial up on inequality, you get leaders being overthrown violently at a much higher rate. So fighting with the divided army is a really bad idea. So this breaks up, uh, for, so every one of those armies, we went back to and said, what happened to your leader during the war? And what happened to the leader two, up to two years afterward? So for all of those exits, you pull them all together, as you turn up the dial, you get a much higher probability that they're going to be overthrown. But it's when is it really key. It's during wartime, and it's by foreign armies. These are the two driving indicators of overthrow. So if you're trying to fight with a divided army, it's not only bad for your army, it's also bad for your political survival. You have a window of vulnerability that opens up during wartime, and typically by foreign armies. There is a little bit here to suggest domestic actors might also get involved, but the threat is overwhelmingly coming from foreign armies. So if you try and fight this way, you do leave yourself open to be challenged on Not just your army, it may be you. Now, who had nukes? Almost no one else in this data set has nukes, and that's a, that's a very different scenario. But if you're looking from historical patterns, Putin with the divided army and the way he's fighting now and potential disintegration in Ukraine, he is upping the risk of an, what we call an irregular exit, basically, uh, being overthrown. Uh, and typically when that's happened, it's come from foreign arms. Uh, okay, so, so the next step, so just wrapping up here, because I've probably talked about it way too long. Uh, so one of the things that I would love to have done with the book, but again, it's very long, uh, is look at other kinds of inequality. So income inequality, gender inequality, uh, religious divisions or sectarian divides, and one of the United States, ideological polarization. Does that also operate like an identity? Um, if, if this book is a success, I hope it will be at some point, um, five to 10 years from now, I would love to see people talking about multiple inequalities, how they intersect, right? And I think in Russia today, we're actually seeing ethnic and religious divisions within his army and class divides. And they're intersecting in really powerful ways inside the army to, to gut the military performance of the army. So one is we need to talk about inequalities, not just inequality. Uh, two, again, sort of macro level, um, we're doing work now actually uh, working with Alex Downs um, to look at whether inequality affects whether you win or not. Uh, the actual war, it turns out the more highly unequal you are, the worse you're going to do at these wars you typically lose. Um, and the thing I'm doing now uh, with the, the U.S. military is actually doing lab and field experiments with uh, special forces and uh, other uh, sort of formations in the U.S. to look and see how diversity is affecting decision making and the ability to complete complex tasks and things like that. And as part of that, we're looking at white nationalism, uh, white political extremism inside the ranks, and what exposure to that does to the trust bonds inside the army. So, so picking up these trust bonds and saying, can we actually experimentally see evidence of that exposure to white nationalism will reduce trust in humans? Um, and so on, and this, on the end of the policy side, uh, just really quickly, so um, what is this leads us to ask how you can best um, harness diversity inclusion in the military right now? Uh, that has become a hot button issue. My email is full of really angry people who don't like diversity, telling me they don't like diversity in the military because it's destroying the military's culture. Um, and there are ways to do it, but arguably the U.S. is behind in thinking through these kind of things. Um, it gets the diversity side, it doesn't get the inclusion piece. Um, maybe there's something we could talk a bit more about. Um, people also read this book and say, well, you don't like technology. And it's not, it's not true. I just think when we focus on the drones and the technology, like the high-end technology stuff, we miss the human side. And I think that's the analytical mistake we made at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. 
But it's the same mistake we made when we analyzed Afghan military performance. It's the same mistake that we made when we analyzed ISIS military performance relative to Iraq in 2014, 2015, right? It's actually the same mistake the intelligence community made in Ethiopia too. Um, and recently. And so there are a lot of wars that are going on right now where we are miscalibrating how we think about military power and it's leaving us open to like really big mistakes because the human side is not there because we're focused on the technology, the shiny stuff, the things we can count. And I say it's really about the interaction between the two powers. You can't call it a human count and an enemy. And then, uh, and then really that's really the last piece. The intelligence community needs to stop being so fascinated with the things that we count. The satellite imagery and things like that. And frankly, you probably need to invest in area specialists, people who know culture, people who know armies, the human side of these things. They get abstract of the radar theories, but the intelligence community does the same thing, right? And it focuses heavily on things that can count because that's what budget is and that's what makes sense. And again, I'm not against counting things, I love to count things, but um, we have to make sure we're counting the right things. And with this inequality index, you can actually have a quantifiable measure of. Of inequality, it's just you have to have the cultural kind of wherewithal to look for it, and you're not going to probably get that from a satellite. Um, and so, with that, I'll stop and, and throw it open to questions or Zoom or wherever. Um, so, thank you very much. Would you like to start with questions yeah. from the room, and then uh, Danny and I will have a look at the Zoom questions? Um, so thank you. Super, super interesting talk. Um, really, really love the book as well. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether you see these effects in the U.S. military over time. And we talked a lot about uh, the, the Af like we talked a little bit about the Afghan military. And so yeah. But if you think about U.S. military performance in World War II, Korea, um, Vietnam is sort of at this kind of turning point in terms of the status of African Americans. Yes. Um, and then, you know, you look at Gulf War and today, do you see these kinds of effects in terms of battlefield effectiveness for the United States? Um, were these sorts of problems at the root of what uh, what went wrong in Vietnam? Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. So the short answer is yes, these dynamics are present in the United States uh, military today, but have been historically. Uh, and you can go back actually to World War One and look at um, promises of inclusion and then how the segregation was dealt with inside the militaries. Um, Matt Delmont, who's a wonderful Dartmouth historian, just wrote a, a wonderful new book on the African American experience in World War II and, and how, on the one hand, they're fighting freedom abroad, but then subject to segregation at home and thinking this is like the double victory. They want to be able to come back and win the war abroad so they can win the war at home. So, um, and so this, the US military said, uh, Stop start with African American, particular integration. Uh, it has uh, one step said, yes, we want to have a more inclusive policy, and then has always walked it back, typically once the war is over. Um, so, but if we have concrete instances that integration is made for a more lethal military, we do. Uh, Connor Up has a wonderful piece on the Korean War looking at um, integration by, uh, by Truman and the desegregation of the military. And the units, once they're desegregated, actually perform better than they did when they were segregated. Uh, so, for example, they inflict greater casualties on the enemy forces. They they take people casualties on their own. Um, there's also anecdotal evidence to suggest that they show more initiative, uh, particularly among the African American soldiers who wanted to show that they belonged, and this is a way for them to, to earn full citizenship. Uh, and that the military started realizing that hey, these guys want to fight, and so rather than having them segregated units, we should integrate them as almost like force multipliers or morale multipliers. Vietnam, though, is the interesting case because their race relations were atrocious inside the military. Um, and so, and, and Vietnam is a fascinating case. I mean, so I wanna, uh, but I mean, African American casualties are very, very high relative to the proportion um, that they served in the military. Um, units that had African Americans had a higher rate of fragging their senior officers than the um, more segregated units. So, um, so so diversity alone doesn't get you what you need. You can get an inclusion piece that arguably wasn't there in Vietnam. Um, so no senior black officers, for example, um, no real promotion or advancement. And so there you had the diversity, which didn't have any benefits of it. And in fact, they basically took the race relations in the United States and imported it to Vietnam and then grew up units. Um, they had a, a whole host of morale issues, health issues um, from there. Now we have a professional military is different, right? So the drafts are very different than the professional ones. Um, but just to fast forward today, I mean, so I worked a bit with the army, and the army will say things like, "Well, it was like 
one, we all bleed green, so we don't need to see race, right? And it's kind of like, well, your soldiers see it, so you might want to. The other thing is, um, more seriously, they kind of get the sense of diversity being important. And so, like, your promotion materials, recruitment materials are very effective. It's cornucopia of you know, people on it, right? But not the senior officer ranks. And that is a big problem right now. Like, the senior officers do not look like their army. And so, African American, Latino soldiers um, leave at a higher rate. They get subject to military discipline at a much higher rate than their numbers would suggest. So, the US military has this friction that's going on. Part because it's a, we're a multi ethnic society and then we bring it in. But the big piece now is um, that's a white nationalism mm -hmm. and white extremism and what that is doing. The last 10 years or so, this has been amped up, supercharged. And I, I think right now the US military is probably punching below its weight in what it could generate because the trust issues are starting to really become endemic in certain ways, right? including the special forces, I would say, which has been fighting for a long time now, rotation after rotation. It is dealing with some serious diversity issues right now that are harming its readiness and its effectiveness. And so, uh, you know, I get it, the tanks and the missiles and, you know, China's a big threat and there's all that money for that kind of stuff. But there is a, that's a hardware issue. There's a software issue inside the military that isn't getting resolved right now. And that's what worries me. Hardware stuff in the United States is really good at it. The software piece is a lot left to go. I don't know if that was, that's all yeah. the yeah, would you talk a little bit about this from the standpoint of the enemy? Uh, the, the phrase, and there is a phrase, of course, divide and conquer. Yes. Which seems to fit your thesis perfectly. Absolutely. In other words, what you want to do is try to make use of these divisions, and then yes. the other side can be defeated. Yes. But uh, bad armies frequently do the reverse. So, for example, you, you do with the Russian case, uh, the Germans basically were, were going to pursue anybody who wasn't Germanic. Yes. Everybody's driving, you know, if you're Slav or anything, uh, 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 Central Asia or whatever, it's said we drove them together. And a similar thing happened with ISIS. Uh, you know, initially, the countries are falling apart. You have Shia, Sunni, Kurds, militias, non militias, and everything. And uh, they still didn't get along very well. Yes. But the American effort, one of the main, I just was reading Michael Gordon's book. Yes. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, the main thing the United States did was not so much bomb as keep these guys fighting and saying, you know, and, and what happened helped a lot was ISIS is genocidal. Uh, and, you know, basically, we don't kill these guys, we're going to kill all of us. Uh, and that was, uh, but they've seen in that. And so you attack from the West, you attack from the South, you attack from the North. You know, there's, there's a joint thing, but they still didn't, didn't necessarily coalesce all that well. Exactly. But anyway, the, 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 so you got. In one case, the enemy uh, making use of it and divide and conquer thing, but the other case, foolishly, from its own standpoint, obviously, is 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 making the diversity less essentially. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a great point. So, if you have a smart adversary, they can get inside your army if you're fighting this way and rip at the seams, basically through propaganda or through other means. The best case I've seen of this, actually, recent one, is the Ukrainian. Uh, social media. Right. They are running a master class on how to dismantle an army from the outside. Uh, their social media is targeted at the Chechens or the broadly Pakistanis and English. Uh, they are um, they are so culturally aware. It's fascinating. So just to take one step back, a big chunk of the Russian army is Kyrgyz. Uh, it has come in from Kyrgyzstan and they are serving on professional contracts so that they can send remittances on their family. They do not want to be in Ukraine. That is not what they signed up for. They signed up for money to go home and a chance of Russian citizenship so they can stay and be an anchor to support their family. They do not want to fight in Ukraine. So, uh, so Ukrainians are targeting the Kyrgyz specifically in their language, the Kyrgyz, and saying, like, here's, you know, why are you fighting? You shouldn't be here. If you want to desert, we'll leave an avenue open for you. You guys head that way. We won't bomb that way. If you fight, we're going to hit you. But if you go this way, so leave these avenues open. And so they have been inside ripping, and, and then they've been going after the conscripts, right? The conscripts generally don't want to be in this army either. And they've been doing exactly the same thing, but they're targeting them saying, you know, you're going to die for Washington, you're going to die for a cell phone that you're going to steal. You don't want to be here, go home. And if you want to go home, go that way. Go this way, we're going to hit you. And they can do it real near real time to cell phone transmissions, interceptions, things like that. They're calling their numbers, they're calling their families. They're doing it on social media with like TikTok videos and Telegram, all this kind of thing. So in a real time, the Ukrainian military has been and they got it to right and how to, how much you can maximize the sort of social power. But and this is the frustrating thing in the book. A lot of times you'll you read these armies, 
And this one divide will have a clear cleavage in there, and the other army won't take advantage of it. And they, they actually just make it worse, as you say. And, and the Germans were one who did this because of the took an ideology, right? And they just came in and said, this is the way it's going to be. And they so many Russians would have deserted or defected. And they said, well, no way, because we can't we can't trust the Germans what they're going to do to us. Um, the Italians did this uh, against uh, the Turkish forces too. They basically used population reprisals and that forced everybody to support the rebels or the, the rebel armies, but they didn't want to. But they don't, didn't have the cultural awareness or, or in some cases, straight up racism to say, like, you know, I'm not looking at these divisions, they're all lower class people anyway. I don't see the fault lines and we're just going to treat them badly. And, all the people are like, and they miss these opportunities. And so I hope, I mean, I know the United States has spotters all over Ukraine right now and the high command and things like that. I hope the lessons we're taking are not just about like HIMARS and the technology we're using, but also about the Ukrainian social media campaign. Because this is going to be crucial for a lot of the kind of conflicts the United States wants to fight. It has to have the cultural sensitivities to try this. You don't always have to be violent. Even if you're an army, you can be using the social power of social media to, to pull on it. But you have to you have to know to look. And right now, I don't think temperamentally the U.S. Army is built to look. And that's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great talk. So I was wondering, or I was thinking as I was. Um, um, you know, following your presentation about what what are some other characteristics of societies that would be oppressive or unequal that might also be associated with poor combat effectiveness. Yeah. Right? So the same societies that would be you know repressive or unequal might also be you know authoritarian. They might also be corrupt. They might also be uh, have a diminished sense of nationalism. Their soldiers might be more likely to be poor, so they're really just there for the paycheck, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure in myriad ways you, you deal with that issue on the empirical side, but I would love to hear yeah. more about it. You no, know, this is a great question, right? I mean, because it, it's really, is inequality actually doing anything, or is it the conditions that lead to inequality that are driving the bus here? Um, so you can never rule out anything in an observation study, uh, you know, in terms of in terms of rotated variable, but What's super interesting about military inequality is it affects very small powers and very great, great powers, like the Soviet Union. So some of the biggest ones are small ones. Um, it will affect it's in contemporary armies. So in terms of like education, the literacy will be higher now in the 19th century, but it's there as well. Um, it doesn't track with any of the conventional measures we use with regime type. Uh, the only one that is a little bit negatively correlated is democracy. But only in the later stages. It's interesting enough, we actually had, well, I mean, the United States, or we can go back to that, it has actually had a high degree of segregation inside it, even though it's democracy. Um, so it doesn't really track with the regime type either. Um, it's not, a, there's not a great measure for poverty necessarily. You don't have GD coverage for all these kind of countries. Um, but if you have some, I mean, like Soviet Union or Germany, these are pretty powerful, pretty rich kind of, maybe Germany in um, But it has some of the poorest countries. Uh, in the we also have very divided armies. We also see things like um, countries that are fighting for their independence. They're barely even states. They're just trying to marshal an army. Some of them are really divided and highly unequal, and some are very inclusive and go on a fight. So, um, so there there may be like something lurking out there that's you know tying all this in together. Um, but I haven't really found it yet. It seems like there's a lot of I mean there's a lot of covariates where it just seems to be. Doesn't track mm -hmm. if, if I could ask a yeah. follow up yeah. from online and then I have a follow up. Oh, yeah, sure. up and then we'll go back to the same. Up. But um, Alex went online uh, asks whether he uh, proposes another pair of comparisons, which is the German army in uh, the, the first and the second world wars, where in both cases you would have a high degree of ethnic homogeneity in the army, but the class relations are very different. So in the, in uh, 1918, the German army collapses, and this is at the time of you know Renoir and Lanay and Picture. It's yes. the time of yeah. extreme class division versus uh, the Nazis understanding that you have to democratize the army 
to have a functioning military machine. So what about class inequality? Yeah, so so that's a great question. Thank you, Alex, for, for the question. Um, so one of the, if I can go back in time with this book, I think we were talking about a little bit of lunch and say, is there another inequality that I would want to bring into the class? Because I think class does a lot of work. And I can't see it because it's not in the regression and things like that. But um, but I think class is, is very, very important. Uh, in particular, this actually example is a really nice one for the German Army in World War I. The World War II is an interesting one because the collapse. So we have our stereotype sort of view of the German Army in World War II as the sort of Aryan uh, supremacy, right? It is driven, it's all ethnically German. Um, and that actually is not true. So by the end of the war, but even from 43 on, that army is becoming incredibly ethnically mixed, um, but very, very um, unequal inside. So you have everyone from Swedes and Finns fighting in it, Italians fighting in it. There are Russians actually fighting in the German army. Um, in fact, it's fascinating. When we're doing the research on this, there's actually Jewish and half Jewish uh, soldiers in the German and the Nazi army in World War II. Um, very small, enough, but but still. And so as you get to later in the war, unlike the first uh, war, this World War, the Second World War, the German army does not look like it did at the beginning. It is completely changed and it become arguably much more unequal over time. So the ethnic component, so I, I would, I think Ox's question is, is a great one, and I think class is important for sure. But I think the World War II comparison is a little tricky because it's becoming less German over as it fights and much more uh, uh, mixed, much more diverse, and much more hierarchical. The Germans on top and everybody else kind of below, and then the Russians on top. And so he's having a hard time marshalling all these beasts. I think it's 22 different ethnic groups, if I got the number right, that were in the German army by the end of the war. And so, um, and so I, I totally agree class on this work, but I, I don't think we should lose out of the ethnic component in the second world war, for sure. But yes, I would love for somebody to pick this up and do class. Mm -hmm. I, think it, I think it's exactly right. Could I ask a follow-up about, uh, so you're stressing prior societal inequality, and I'm wondering about unequal discriminatory treatment in the moment within the unit. Yes. And I, it seems to me like the natural test case for this might be prior to your period would be pre napoleon armies that depend on foreign militaries, so that um, the hierarchical relationship of the army would not be mitigated by any kind of national identification or so what about discrimination in the moment? Yeah, this, this is a great question too, because the way it is sort of presented here, you kind of, your fate is locked in, even before the battle begins, right? And there's no ability for the army to adjust. Um, and actually, in period, that happens a lot. Like you kind of, you board your prejudices and the state policies kind of come into the army, but not all the time. Um, and, and actually, there's a couple instances in the Russian army where um, they had local commanders for people who spent time in the region, particularly in Central Asia, so, like one out of every three Russian Soviet soldiers who fought on the Eastern Front after 1914 was from Central Asia. Right? And how do they get these soldiers? Well, they said, we're, we're going to review the social contract and we're going to sort of make you full citizenship. So, they're trying to adjust on the fly. That translates a little bit down to the actual units. If you had enlightened commanders who could use that propaganda and who had spent time in the region, maybe spoke the language, they could try and soften the prior exposure. I mean, you see things um, where the commanders say things like, look, I know you weren't treated there. I know your people suffered. Let's just win this war. Let's get through this together, and then we'll change the social contract every day. So you, you see like, some of these, and again, it's about all the commanders, but some of them are trying to meet in the heat of a very intense war, trying to adjust the discriminatory practices on the fly, trying to soften them a little bit. Um, sometimes they soften, sometimes they work. Those stereotypes really big in. Um, and this is where we see in the US uh, military today, too. There is a sense of like the army itself has a problem, but that enlightened commanders can fix things uh, in their own units. They can't change the institution, but they can change within to some extent around recruitment and retention and things like that. And so it's not necessarily this, it's not right to say that your pre war inequality you know, score is the fate, you're completely trapped. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty constrained. So I think it's like more like a straight jacket. It is possible to get out of it, but it's very hard and to be very costly. Uh, so, but, but there is some rebuilding if you're in the light. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, this was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I haven't had a chance to read the book, but I'll definitely read it soon. 
Uh, my question was about humanitarian assistance. Actually, you mentioned that uh, you were drawing lessons about humanitarian assistance based on your findings here. Oh, I, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like, was... So, not so on the findings here, but uh, okay. um, so the, the other side of me is a field uh, research oh. guy in Afghanistan. Oh. So, uh, oh, well, no, not just Afghanistan, um, but yes, yeah, so I'm writing a book on trying to explain mm -hmm. um, yeah, the effectiveness of humanitarian aid. And, in like violent and tragic places like oh, okay. yeah oh, okay so I, i'm not sure if this is going to translate yet but i'm still yeah. really gay so. oh, okay. if it's not going to translate then i you can pass with my okay friend. yeah i have a question especially on an event on um I, I was wondering um how we explain the fall of the Afghan national army um and security forces during the Afghan takeover uh as it relates to inequality um because i think but, I mean, from from experience and from what I know about the, the, the Afghanistan military is that they're pretty, um, they're pretty like they're not really um, one ethnic groups over the other. For example, it's not actually you know, there's like specific mixture of, of them, right? Yeah. Um, and that um, in, in different areas they were, you know, they either maintained uh, their ability to fight the Taliban to the last minute, and in some cases they gave up. Um, so how does that? How do you explain that sort of different different relation? Even this, even though that the um, the army itself is at least in the recent times, in the past times, to be more mixed compared to the you know, the northern Taliban, the northern alliance at the beginning of the uh, of the Taliban uh, of the of the one process. Yeah, so it's a great question. I think this is like chapter six. I'm trying to I'm trying to get my my head around it too. And in fact, we're um, trying to map out which units broke when, so they kind of get a sense. So I think uh, I would I would just I would tweak your question. It's a great question. So I would tweak it just a little bit. So I think the breakdown of the Afghan army started shortly after we started creating it, uh, and so it's been a long process of breaking it down. And so we we look at the last couple, you know, the last six months basically, right? And say, wow, this whole thing just basically fell apart. Yeah. Uh, and and in a there was more resistance than we think in that six months, but there also there was way more collapse <laughs> than we think by just looking at the last six months. And so. Um, for me, I mean, there's there's a number of ways in which inequality comes in. Uh, one is that most Afghanis, because of the mixing strategy that they tried, mm -hmm. um, had very little trust inside. They basically were like cliques that had that had formed around ethnic or tribal ties. So the Pashtun uh, soldiers were particularly divided around the tribe and were only drawn from certain areas. And then the Tajiks uh, didn't necessarily get along with Anzar, didn't necessarily get along with Uzbeks. So there's a lot of mistrust in there already. So these units, when they tried to mix them, because in fact, a lot of this, a lot of the uh, initial stuff was like, it's a melting pot. We need to be diverse. Let's throw it all in together. And then we threw it in together and they didn't like each other um, and, and didn't trust each other. So a lot of those units were very easy to the Taliban to come up to and say, you don't really want to fight, do you? I think what you'd like to do is sell your weapon. Right? Sell your weapon. And then we can go. Or we won't shoot you. So tons, and really starting in 2015, there were tons of like side deals being set, but the Taliban coming up to the bases that they mostly encircled them at that point, and they would say, like, you want to do this. So they would they would look at the core constituencies, look at the Ashraf Ghani administration, said that's not my government. Mm -hmm. That was that was particularly the non Pashtun groups. So they could peel off Tajiks, they could peel off Uzbeks, and Tatar pretty easily. Uh, mostly it depends where it is. Then the Pashtuns themselves were divided. And so the Taliban would then start brokering deals with them as well. Now, there are some of the Pashtun tribes that sided with Ashraf Ghani's administration, and those ones apply mm -hmm. because they, they didn't see a future for them if they didn't stand in front of them. Because they said, that's my government, that's, but if this thing goes down, we're in trouble. Right? So that partly why you see some units fighting hard, and partly why you see a lot of these collapse and melt away is due to who the Pashtuns were inside. And then also the local sort of geographic uh, area that they were operating in, and their relationship to local peoples. A lot of these, um, a lot of what the policy was was to put units in places where they had no local support, but they were different ethnically. Uh, and that was meant to, to stop them from like, being corrupted. But that also meant you were surrounded in, in an area that was not friendly to you, or you were cut off. So when they, the Taliban would say, Would you like to go home or would you like to flee? Can you get out of these areas that are dangerous to you? They would say, Go. Or they would strike ceasefire deals. So it's really um, who was favored by the regime and who was not, and who saw the government as to representing them and who did not. I think it was one of the big deciding uh, issues. And I think Ashraf Ghani made an enormous mistake 
Um, right around like 2016, 2017, we began to purge the military of all those Taji and the Uzbek officers. And the second that they went out, every soldier of those persuasions said, This is not my regime, this is not my government, I don't have a place in here. And that's when the rock really set in. Weapons being sold, he started being struck, ghost soldiers multiplying because they saw their power base. And of course, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, um, so I think they, for example, like you mentioned, like they will have to go to, you know, the, the regions where the Chinese and Uzbeks and others are based on. Um, and the Ottomans, based on history, this guy is not friendly to them, you know. Yeah. Um, so that, I found that really interesting in the sense that they're able to co opt uh, an ethnic groups that are really should be yes. uh, supporting the government. And I was wondering whether. There is a concept where that you know the military itself was essentially, as you mentioned, it was it broke down from the beginning because it wasn't really built on on strong ties to the to actually their communities, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the military was just there because you know the US government was paying all this money and it was because of serious operations and it wasn't necessarily actually built to defend the communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so when it shit went wrong, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Because, so it's so it's time to be you know, so. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you see there's a there's more like a, an issue of focusing on like counter seriously or external partners like sort of motives and, and goals rather than actually building a, a proper army? Oh, I mean, that's for sure. I mean, the U.S., I mean, I, I think the U.S. engaged in mirroring, right? It, it tried to build an army that looked like it itself because that's what it understands how to fight. And then, uh, well, it made a lot of mistakes. Uh, one was trying to get the police to be a counter to the Police should not be exempted. I think police have similar dynamics as the armies do. Uh, and so, and we see that in the United States, uh, and so I think the counterinsurgency strategy was wrong. I think the police did the counterinsurgency strategy was wrong. I think the US tried to build something that was wrong for the strategic environment. But I think it goes back to your question, actually. So, in my view, most analysts seriously underestimate how good the Taliban were at lots of things that we were really bad at. But one of the best things that they were at, uh, good at is diplomacy. And if you look at security studies in the last 20 years, and I'm guilty of this too, right? You know, I mean, we had to classify data from Afghanistan and Iraq, we run our models and all this kind of stuff, and we're showing reductions of violence and the you know, well, you know, to the nth degree. But the Taliban are out there, and like fighting for them is not the point of the insurgency, right? It's to build their the relations and the ties to the government space eventually. So they're out there doing all this diplomacy that nowhere in our data sets. We just don't see it because we don't code it, we don't track it, we don't look for it, right? And they're out there, um, and, and let's go back to your point, they were able to co-op Taji with Uzbek, um, English commanders, army commanders. So a lot of my field work is in Kunduz, so in the north, um, and that's a mix of a, a heavy Pakhtun, uh, not super heavy, but it's 30 to 40 percent Pakhtun, a lot of Uzbek, a lot of Taji. I knew, I mean, I, well, my first year in 2009, I knew the war wasn't going well. But one of my last trips to the, to the north was in 2015, and, and there we, had, we no longer just saw uh, Taliban or Pakistan, we saw Taliban who were respected, uh, who were supposed to be, as you say, the natural enemies, right? And, and once I saw the co-optation going in the north, I was like, that's game over, because that's the stronghold uh, and, and for the administration. And, and once they could get inside that, you know, the U.S. is in trouble. And, and again, and, mm -hmm. Most analysts miss this because we're not looking at these tribal ethnic ties. We're, we're counting how many soldiers got deployed, how much fuel did they use in their patrols, how many soldiers did they train today, and not this sort of quiet diplomacy that we're left just on these ties. So I think the power base was passed inside the passion, but they were smart enough to bridge across the two GDP gathers back in the project. Yeah. We're actually some high star. Yeah. Like, I mean, those. I mean that that to me is mind blowing, right? But that's that's how bendable and flexible they're for That's interesting. Yeah, sorry. This was great. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to read your book. Um, so I have two questions. One you teased us a couple times. Uh -oh. We got to class, but we didn't get to the I'm interested in the religious dimension. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, okay. what well, your hypothesis there is. And then I have one yeah. other historian's question. I'm curious how you dealt with the US in 1898 and the Philippines, Filipino insurgents. Yeah. Um, and because that's certainly a conflict that cost the U it cost the U.S. a lot more than the war itself with Spain. How do you deal with that? Right. So that's multiple, uh, multiple battlefronts, multiple. Yeah, yeah. So these are great. These are great questions. Um, but very quickly, uh, the 1898 one. 
So this data suppression virus only tracks conventional wars, and the, the side of the, the war with the Philippines, if you change that as part of the sphere, is kind of surface. So that's actually parsed out into a different set of chem insurgencies. Mm -hmm. and, and really just, I, I, I gotta go back and look again. Uh, I think it gets assigned to strictly the counter insurgency campaign, more so than a conventional force on force between the US and Spain. Um, and so it would not show up in this data set, it would show up in some of the earlier work I did So on that one, that's a quick answer, it's not, it's not there. But, um, but the gender and religion, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so. So can I talk gender? Sure. Yeah. So this is one of the experiments that we're we're trying to get up off the ground. So um, no pun intended. So I um I was out in Air Force uh, Academy and they have women cadets now uh and who are going to flight training. And um they have a, a amazing simulation group. 18 cadets can fly together on, on simulators, right? And um, and they can train any kind of missions. So the class has an objective. Like an assignment, you're given um, instructions to complete some task. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, we now have we have enough women in there to have like all women groups and then all men. Mm -hmm. uh, and anecdotally, what they're picking up is that the women and the men approach the task very, very differently and solve it very differently. So let me just give you one example. So the class exercise that they were showing us um, was uh, was you had to uh, shut down a surface to air missile site in North Korea. And shut it. That was their instructions. There's 18 women, they set up a battle plan. There's 18 men that set up a battle plan. So the guys say, right, strike package, we're going right down the throat, we're going to knock this thing out, we're going to blow it up, and they lose half their aircraft. Right? The women read the instructions of the assignment, <laughs> hang a, a, a jamming aircraft up there, jam a surface air missile, and they're not. Right? Because it didn't say you had to destroy it, it just said you had to take it offline. Uh -huh. right? And so that's just one example. But So the men and the women are playing differently. But it, what we're seeing is just very anecdotally, right? And so, like, so when I was asking the instructors, they say the women are much more consensus based and the men are much more like one alpha of the guys is like, this is the way everybody follows it. You know? uh, and then in the mixed groups, which is what I'm most bigger, just saying, yeah. the mixed groups uh, shift over to the way the men uh, think. Mm -hmm. So they're dominated by a loud person in that group, so they alpha or whatever. Um, but they've noticed that it, that. Dominance changes depending on how many women are in the group. So as you get closer to 50 50, you can take down sort of the male side of the decision, right? But these are small numbers right now, and they're just slowly starting to do this. So part of what I would do with trying to do the Air Force Academy is get them to experiment with the different things, right? So you can you can change the composition of the groups by gender. You can have the board names, you can have the simulation. Um, but my, my sense is right now, so it's accrued prior is that women obviously think this problem is different than men, the decision making process is different than men. Um, they seem to be, uh, interestingly enough, slower in their decision making cycles, but have better outcomes in terms of the objective metrics. So, something about the speed at which they're approving to uh, as a group is different. Um, so, I think there's a ton of these effects. But I don't know, and, and so I'm watching, and I'm not a gender scholar by any stretch, but I'm watching what this literature is forming in political science, and it's still in the phases of like, women are different than men, so let's look for differences. It's not yet, I think, at the phase where it's like, how are the women different than men, like in what specific ways it can be captured, but also can be adjusted. So uh, part of what I would love to be able to do is, is that uh, these experiments we're trying. Uh, the religious component, so it, kind of, it comes in a little bit here to the extent that it tracks with ethnicity. If there's like uh, religion and ethnicity co, co occurring, um, then that identity is going to be really sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it would also be entirely plausible to go back to the Project Mars data. We have all the ethnic groups that mm -hmm. each other on base, and then you could go back and codify it religiously. Which is and so, my sense is to the extent that religion and ethnicity co occur, then it, uh, ethnicity really stable and the effects are really hard. If there's cross cutting religions in there, um, it may soften some of the ethnic base in the policies because it gives them a more common identity that a more shared identity on which you could build trust inside the units, depending on how the armies separate them. Yeah. So uh, so my answer on that is uh, I don't know yet. I think I mean I think it's, I think it definitely matters and I think it matters over and above the more capture. So I think it's it's Partially captured here, but not, not fully. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, I mean, there's still army today that makes a lot, that don't make a lot that make, that make a lot of that. So the Indian army is an asset in case, right? They're divided religiously. Mm -hmm. 
So there are still armies where we can look and say, uh, how do they perform? What are they, uh, um, how, how do they perform the battlefield? How do they keep the religious practices? Things like that. Uh, last thing I'll say on this, just really quick, there is a, a video that went viral uh, on social media from the war uh, in Ukraine where Russian officers were reading um, uh, Muslims in their units, uh, prohibiting them from praying, and then uh, and then beating them as being uh, for being Muslim. And so there's an act of hazing going on along the religious lines in the Russian army. It's fascinating. If I can take one question from online and then okay. finish up with a question for Chris, if that's okay. Um, so I have a question here from Maria Malang. And it's relevant actually to the work of our postdoc Zena Quadri. Oh, good. Okay. You can answer this one. <laughs> she says, What are the implications of inequality on increasing state reliance on private military contractors and pro government militias or state sponsored insurgencies? The former is an issue the US has, re has repeatedly dealt with, the latter, an issue that plagued weak militaries in the Middle East. Africa and South Asia. Yeah. This question may be related to your work on the military efficacy of these armies and the type of violence they can implement. It is a great question. It's a great question. Because uh, just a, a first cut, the inequalities in talking about these armies will also be in these militia if they're built this way uh, and in the sort of proxy forces that are being used, right? So this isn't just about you know having your own army or even in the United States building other people's armies. It's also about using proxies and having these same pathologies inside them. Now, the, if so, if you're not careful, you may just redesign divided armies that just, just call it proxy or whatever. The trick is, and, and, and to some extent, I think this is true the auxiliary forces or the paramilitary forces or, or the private military companies, whatever we want to call them, can actually be somewhat of a solution to a divided army. If you could contract out discipline in some ways, right? Or if you knew your army was too ramshackle to fight, you could basically draft in a new one. So we see the mercenaries historically, right? You could bring them in and it, you know, if you thought your army was terrible uh, or proxies to backstop it. But like, I get to go back to the Russian example in the Wagner group. So the Wagner group is this uh, Kremlin affiliated private military company that the Russians have been using to prosecute the wars in Libya and in Syria, but they're doing it now in uh, Ukraine as well. And what's fascinating to watch is how the Russians layer their forces. So you can actually see inequality in your real time. You'll often have the, the draftees at the front, uh, and then you'll have, or the marginalized groups at the front. And then you'll have um, the Wagner group layering behind them to force them forward because they're more reliable. And so you know that this initial echelon or, or, or rows of, that you're sort of pushing forward, they're not trustworthy, but they're also cannon fodder. Right, because they're not coming from the, the central regions of Russia. And then you have the Wagner group that you trust and you pay very well and they have the best weapons sit in that middle like a sandwich on it and then push them forward. It is a way historically that armies have tried to, to try to generate more effectiveness um, than they otherwise might be able to from their own internal uh, sort of staff or, or human capital. And so the Russians doing this with the, the Wagner group are uh, are sort of prime example of trying to generate more combat power when they know so a big chunk of the army is not reliable. But I think there's a huge research program out there where we're taking this and then proxy forces, militia, paramilitaries, I mean, barely even scratch the surface, you know, for what where we think and police uh, policing that too. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of coercive organization, if it's got these inequalities, you know, it's gonna affect how it fights and how well it fights, and also frankly, how it treats civilians. You haven't really talked about it, but I mean, one of the reasons you get barbarism in the Russian army right now is because of, of how it's been put together. Uh, and it's victimizing the population in part because the soldiers are unreliable because of their sort of unequal status. So they're seeking vengeance in the civilian population. Right? So it's a great question. <laughs> I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking at this. All right, let's finish up with a question from Castelfi. Um, well, and, and I'll, I'll make it two questions, but they're both sort of short. Um, so one is, uh, how did the Ukrainian military figure out to do this stuff that they're doing in Ukraine when everybody else in the United States and all the developed armies didn't understand that this needed to be done? And they obviously understood something, 
about fighting the Russian military that, that we hadn't thought about. So question one is like, yeah. where did they get that idea from? Have they read your book? Like what's, uh, <laughs> <Probably not>. and, <laughs> um, and second question is uh, just thinking about examples of like multi-ethnic militaries and effectiveness. Um, Israel has uh, is, is known to have one of the more um, effective militaries and yet is a highly ethnically diverse military yeah. and, um, and obviously has sort of ethnic inequalities. I'm wondering how they manage that. Has the occupation of uh, of the West Bank and, and and the encirclement of Gaza since '73 has that undermined um, yeah. Israeli military effectiveness? Like, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so on the first one, so on Ukraine, you know, well, I mean, so part of it again is that they've been fighting the Russians for a while now. I think um, we see, we sort of say, well, February the war started. Well, not really, right? So 2014, 2015, really when the war began in some sense. And so they have experience with this and they've been trying some of this already in the DNR and in some of the, uh, among the, actually the Wagner group is active then. Um, I think they've been fine tuning some of this already. So it wasn't that they said, oh my goodness, here's what we do. They've already had the like, those who stock. Does not explain how good they've been though and how fast they've been. That's the thing I, I found remarkable is the adaptation on the fly has been unbelievably fast. And just the bandwidth that they have, right? It just they are intercepting phone calls and, and almost near real time putting it back out into the social media, or they're calling people's moms and things like that. So so where do they I, I don't know. I mean, other than just they do have experience fighting already. Um, and I know it's not from reading the book, but um I actually don't, I don't know. I, mean, I think that's going to be one of the, the big things we're getting out of this war is, is how do they figure this out so fast? How are they so nimble at it? It's probably some like 20 year old kids. He's in there, right? It's it's not like, like old people like me. In other it's like 20 year old TikTokers who is, they're digital natives, right? And they, they get the speed of it and they get, they get what works in the memes, right? And Napo and everybody bought a shirt from St. Javelin and I have my St. Javelin shirt. Like it just, the outreach outside the war and inside the war has been astonishing. astonishing. Uh, on Israel, so the Israeli military is um, is actually really interesting. So it has small units that are ethnically homogenous that are like um, Druze units, for example, that they uh, they let them have their own units and they have their, like a, a heritage to them. Um, there, but I'm just I'm trying to remember this. What happens with the error of the Israeli population? Because I don't think there's very many of them in the Gulf. Um, and I think that is so there's national service, but I think the error of population inside Israel is exempt from the mandatory service. And so so Israel has, I think, essentially said, I have to I'll, I'll double check on that, but I think that's right. They they have essentially said we're not going to draw on the full net of our state. So you, you deliberately say, I'm not going to bring this population in, particularly now. Uh, since the since the second uh, since the second and the second end of the fight, this is like a, this is a bridge too far for us. So they do have like Berber units, they do have Druze units. They're very small, but I, I think it's actually pretty homogenous for this reason to keep on bridging Well, thank you so much. We are just for the camera. Are we over here? We are so happy that you have honored us with your first in person visit since yes. uh, well, since the, what, the uh, I think, despite the horror of the subject, we have really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, please thank these thank our prize for the people. <laughs> First live talk since 2020. Thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. I know it's dark and cold now at five o'clock, so I appreciate it. I think it would be like three more books that people have thrown at me that I have to go back and home telling you to think about them. Yeah. 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 And my name didn't get you in time. Sorry, sorry, my new video. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.